Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. My name is Svetlana Pesina. I am from Magnitasburg University, the Department of Translation and Linguistics. Today, we have a second day of our discussions in the framework of the section Cognition and Communication, Linguistic Units in a New Paradigm of Research. Today, we have a very, interest, very interesting presentation on cognitive and fundamental linguistics that relate on various aspects. We'll talk about tenses, semantic uh, specifics of the words on prepositions, uh, spatial prepositions, and the developments of various structures, grammar structures, on the structure of Japanese sentence, on the specifics of the German correspondence. And we have one presentation that will be made in English on social media. I hope we'll enjoy our exchange of opinions. And let me remind you, please use the camera because we want to see real people. And please, you have to keep your mics turned off if you are not participating in the exchange of opinions or not making a presentation. So we have a simultaneous translation and good quality can be reached only if the speed of speech is not too high. So you have time limits for your presentation. It's 10 minutes. So please focus on the key aspects of your research. You may ask questions afterwards by voice or in chat. Our support is Yulia Kazakova and two minutes before the time expires, she'll remind us that we have to stop. That's it. So I wish you successful work and to have a fruitful exchange of uh, uh, opinions and just enjoy ourselves. So the first report, the first presentation is made by Polina Sherba. Ethics and dynamics of time as a metalinguistic category and a culture specific concept. So Polina, the floor is yours. I'm very happy to be here. So I'm the first speaker. I'm a little bit excited and worried. Let me demonstrate, share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes. So let's get started. My name is Palina Shirbo. I represent Moscow State. Uh, regional university. The study I made for today's conference, conference is the statics and dynamics of time as, as a metalinguistic category and a culture specific concept. I think it's a very interesting topic to study how time was uh, regarded in a historical perspective. in the uh, research or science about language and linguistics and how this concept is verbalized in the system of the English language. 
uh, on the, uh, uh, the, uh, in the English worldview. So I'll explore into dualism of understanding of time as a metalinguistic category, as a culturally specific uh, concept. So the time or factor is an important parameter of language linguistic research. It's actually it's one of the most important parameters of the language studies. Uh, alongside with uh, cy uh, cyclonic uh, approach, there is diachronic, panchronic, and achronic approaches. There is a link between statics and dynamics, and it's uh, an important di dialectic opposition that presents the essence of the language of, uh, of the science of language. It, uh, also describes the concept of time. As I said, we, uh, we study the English worldview and we have singled out uh, two uh, systems of conceptualization and metaphorization, the time as a moving essence and the time as a static essence. Uh, and the common ground in understanding of time is under uh, anthropocentric approach. The human being is the center of uh, the assessment whether time is static or dynamic. So there are two uh, the, uh, areas of research in linguistics, uh, the uh, subsequently changing of uh, uh, factors uh, of language and the established stat static uh, systems. And so there are two linguistics. Uh, and Ferdinand de Saussure uh, uh, formulated, gave their definitions, uh, psychronic and diachronic. Uh, he uh, just uh, suggested that the static uh, 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 comparative, uh, etc. Other terms should be um, get rid of, got rid of. So these factors that be, uh, belong to diachronic and uh, synchronic, uh, synchronic factors do not make much sense because they are dual, dual, as they can be interpreted in a different way. And this category of time is an important uh, constituent of a linguistic paradigm in all times. The subsequent uh, development of the linguistics, it developed from the comparative grammar of Indo-European languages and attempts of pra-language pra reconstruction to the uh, royal grammar and to psychological neutrality uh, suggested by Steintal in the uh, middle of the 19th century. According to the uh, Prague Linguistic School, the, uh, the discussion or the study of uh, uh, separate facts uh, just uh, contradicts the linguistic, the language, uh, the science of language. And uh, the structuralism of Copenhagen School, the language is a, a permanent structure which does not belong to any time period. So there was a pan chronic approach to uh, the language up to the 19th century, the middle of the 19th century. So the, the statement was that the it's uh, uh, just uh, uh, panchronic or achronic uh, approach to language. So it was a permanent static structure. The current studies show that the uh, language studies are universally panchronic. Grammar is panchronic, but there are some comparative studies that take into account time time perspective 
So the idea of panchronic and synchronic and diachronic, which is uh, universal versus partial, is the uh, important uh, aspect of language studies. So even if the researchers uh, deny its importance, they still take it into account. They uh, exist parallelly. And they also mutually complement. Let me uh, quote Boudouin de Cartonnet, who said that there is no uh, uh, immobility in language. Even the static, uh, statical aspects show its dynamic. So the time is a metalinguistic category. Sometimes divide the research, uh, sometimes uh, it, it uh, uh, united the research. So time as a specifically culturally bound uh, concept. We can see that there are two approaches, uh, which is based on its uh, contradictions. Uh, as I said, we discuss uh, the English world view. So the language is the main uh, uh, treasury of the concepts and uh, especially culturally bound concepts. Uh, we discuss uh, uh, idioms, uh, uh, sayings as they are the secondary, they uh, present the secondary nomination when uh, language interacts with culture. So we uh, studied the uh, idioms and uh, sayings in English. Uh, sometimes times is presented as moving and sometimes it is presented as static stationary. On the left, you can see uh, the examples of a uh, moving of moving time and on the right you can see its static aspect. And the uh, the factor that uh, uh, unites these two approaches is uh, uh, an anthropocentrism of uh, metaphorization because the human being is the center of uh, this picture so we have uh, come to a conclusion that time is uh, perceived as a dual uh, essence. It can be treated both statically and dynamically, no matter whether we regard it as a parameter of linguistic research or as a verbalized concept. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. I hope you'll have questions. Alina Alexander, thank you very much. So if you have questions, you are welcome. Go ahead. The aspect is really interesting, the panchronic uh, approach. So it unites both synchronic and diachronic approach. Yes, uh, our research uh, has uh, shown that it's important to uh, pull together these two approaches because both are very important. As uh, you know, the medium way is uh, uh, wins, is winning. Though there, there are res uh, research studies that uh, focus on diachronic or psychronic met methods, it depends. So, and we should uh, uh, separate between the language approach and philosophical approach to time, because philosophers say that the uh, future does not exist because future is just our plans and uh, our suggestion, suggestions. Uh, and the past does not exist because uh, it's just our memory. So the real time is uh, the present time, the present tense when we live, through a, a specific, every, each specific moment and we flow with this time. So 
uh, I think that our approach is a little bit different. I think that we'll compare time, ten, ten system and time uh, verbalized in both French and English worldview and language systems, and uh, we'll see whether there is a duality in these worldviews or maybe just uh, perceived as the present tense. And in terms of philosophy, uh, really, it's uh, I try to put together uh, cognitivism, cognitive linguistic, and a philosophical approach, which is a broader approach compared to linguistics. I just wanted to show whether this the time uh, is perceived in the language uh, in the same way as uh, we verbalize the concept. So how we understand the concept in our everyday life. And actually, uh, these two approaches coincided. As far as time, it's uh, really a very topical issue. Any questions? To Paulina Alexeyevna. So let's move on to our second presentation. Paulina Alexeyevna, thank you very much. Uh, Now let's move to our second presentation. Uh, Raman Yevgenich Tilpov, Pushkin State Russian Language Institute, Russia. Types of words, meanings that define the cardinal points. My name is uh, uh, Tilpov Raman. I'm, uh, I represent Pushkin State Russian Language Institute. So my presentation uh, will focus on the cardinal points. Uh, I am going to talk without a presentation. Uh, so we have uh, new classes of objects uh, resorting to new classifications of onomastic terms. There are new layers of words that uh, are in between be, uh, between proper and uh, ordinary names. I think that cardinal points belong to such words, uh, south, east, west, and north. Why are they so important? Uh, as I treat them as uh, uh, words that uh, belong to the middle between uh, the proper and ordinary names. And the, uh, we can see that the political map of the world is changing as uh, such uh, proper names, South Korea, North Korea, South Vietnam, North Vietnam. Now it's West or uh, East Ukraine. Uh, or uh, south and north Kyrgyzia. So through this word, the toponymic system is represented in dynamics. The cardinal points uh, are characterized by their universal uh, character uh, and as a tool of nomination of new territories that uh, depend on uh, politics, culture, and geography. This aspect has not, has not been studied properly. So the cardinal points were studied as the most universal archi uh, archetypes. And they uh, be, uh, were becoming the uh, subjects of uh, studies. For example, uh, by Podasina who was a researcher of the cardinal points in various cultures. They uh, now uh, represent the territorial nominations. And it is illustrated by such ter territorial nominations as West and East Ukraine, South and uh, North Sudan, uh, etc. So the a uh, question about the status of these words still remains unanswered. 
Before we discuss the status, let's uh, uh, look into the lexicographical uh, description. The Russian dictionaries say that there are several meanings uh, in the cardinal points. For example, one is vector. Uh, in Ozhigov, uh, there are vectoral meanings ter and territorial meanings. South, north, east, west. So the Ozhikov Dictionary and Ushakov Dictionary, uh, there are vector, also vector and territorial meanings, and there are some additional meanings that are, uh, uh, that uh, also have some additional meanings, quality meanings. For example, North includes uh, Northern cold country south means southern warm hot countries with hot climate pictorial meanings in different cultures may differentiate for example in english there is a certain practice south is connected with less developed regions and uh, north is usually a more developed one and these associations are prominent in several dictionaries and english culture and russian culture are different in that aspect in, in media pictorial and regional um, meanings differentiate as well for example, Victorial represent themselves with no affiliation with climatic um, sources. For example, Vostochny is going to build a factory in Sakhalin, and it's located on the in the northern part of the island. In this context, it, the place of a factory just means its location without any connection with cultural aspects of the term north. And most, another example, um, there are some areas where ISIS won't be able to reach. and. They are located in 700 kilometers. And that is an, another example of victorial meanings with no connection with cultural um, aspects. Um, in some other examples, North and South may be clenched together and mean only geographical uh, terms, but sometimes they are connected with specific geographical areas which have that cultural context around them. Thus, adding some more deep and interesting context. Another example of cardinal directions being used without any cultural context, we can find in uh, some media notes, uh, uh, for example, connected with the war and conflict around Crimea, No, it's house is written with a capital letter, and that means that these terms represent uh, the parts of the world. 
in south and north a toponymic form. And if they are used in complex, complex composite terms, they represent those geographical Uh, for example, geographical designations mean uh, cardinal directions, but they don't even have those south and north terms. I guess that this absence shows some kind of ambivalence of these terms among other uh, toponymics. There are two vi meanings, victorial and territorial. Victorial represents designated parts of the world, and territorial meaning represents specific territories. And then the names are derived from the specific location and cultural meaning. Uh, cardinal directions are used to nominate geographical locations, especially if they have some cultural or historical significance. For example, the eastern part of Ukraine or the southern part of Sudan, all these toponymic names and terms are used widely in media. Thank you, Roman Yevgenievich. Are there any questions to this presentation among other listeners, among the audience? I have a quite a short question. So this dichotomy of north and south, um, which consists of this difference in economical and cultural factors, does this the dichotomy works in modern in, uh, in modern situation. Uh, it, it it still does work, and for Russian uh, culture, this paradigm still stands. Uh, but for example, in Russia, north and south are connected with temperature, and in Europe, south and north are connected with economical situation in economical development. These terms have different meanings in different contexts, in different cultures, in different countries. Uh, so we can't say that their meanings completely replace each other. What about North and South Korea? This paradigm doesn't quite work because it's vice versa in that example. Oh, thank you, thank you. Are there any any other questions? So now, then, Chris Anapolo Yekaterina, her presentation on the cognitive discursive factors for differentiated uses, English spatial prepositions in, on, and at. The floor is yours. The cognitive discourse factors for differentiated uses of English spatial prepositions in, on, and at. The third slide shows the plan of my short presentation. I would like to start with the prepositions meaning in linguistics and then the context in which they are used. For example, in versus at, at versus on, on versus in. In linguistics, prepositions are described 
as linguistic units that show different relations between main and submissive parts of a collocation or a sentence. And, um, and we can hear you once again. The lexical meaning of prepositions show different relations inside uh, the text. Activation of linguistic concepts shown as nominative words, which is described in several um, papers. And while grammatically there are certain relations between words, this grammatic aspect is also shown in the preposition and it represents the denotative process during the nominative situation inside the language and in my presentation i wanted to show some grammatic aspects of english prepositions and show what motivates their use in certain context and to understand when you um, put an in or an at positions. Prepositions have different roles inside the language. That is why there are certain conditions which which then show us and lead us in a certain direction. I mostly use Frederick Forsyth, both Frederick Rose's novels and uh, some media examples. So there are certain dichotomies which you can hear now. So the first opposition and first factor is the choice of the prepositions in or at in a spatial relation. It's usually represented as a container something in being enclosed so this context is illustrated by examples one and two in the first case Okay. Uh, the book is ostensibly set in. My best to and eating was in the grand office. Cognitive operation in this case is. I can't hear you once again. Which is implicit to our objects. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, but the connection is it's not that good. If you're in the urine, maybe you have some um, conclusions. Probably, if you can hear me properly, I can show you a couple of slides with conclusions of my presentation. As examples show that a preposition is not only an octant representation, but also a cognitive process. 
it's implicit to other place being represented and examples five and six where prepositions are in complementary relations show that that some prepositions have certain degrees of meanings. And the orientation, a position of orientation and inclusion shown in examples on the screen, orients uh, a reader, for example, in, in space in which uh, a certain character is currently located. But then the into preposition is used to show this location. Ekaterina Yurivna. Yes. Ekaterina Yurivna. Unfortunately, the time is up. We don't really have any time for questions, maybe for a short one only. Let me at least show my conclusions. Were you able to find invariant meanings in those prepositions? I only I, I only considered spatial relations, but this cognitive process, which happens during uh, the use of prepositions, shows uh, that probably orientational meaning of the prepositions may be located, may be connected with preposition add and an inclusion is connected with in and, um, some other meanings of on prepositions extrapolate not only on spatial aspects of its use but also on temporal aspects I think that is common to cognition discursive aspects of prepositions that I showed may be extrapolated on um, the other aspects and considered an invariant. Thank you, Katerina Yurivna. Thank you. So, so, like, uh, my topic is conceptual metaphors as mutual influence of source and target domains. Unfortunately, I can't talk my presentation. Can you hear me? So we do not have an uncontradictory uh, perception of the functioning uh, of words with many meanings in a lexicon, mental lexicon. So the studies uh, boil down to two theories. The first series is supported by the Western linguistics, that representation or representativeness of the meanings that are uh, deposited in the mental uh, lexicon uh, as lists, checklist theory. And separate meanings of uh, 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 words with many meaning, uh, meanings as uh, separate lexical units, which are fu functioning in uh, separate representations. So direct meanings 
are deposited in one mental representation as they uh, have the signs of the first uh, direct meaning and metaphorical meanings, the secondary derivative meaning. The second theory uh, boils down to the following. Words are deposited as invariants. So there is a general meaning and the meanings uh, are interconnected in mental lexicon. At present, there are attempts made today to study the semantics of words by computer linguistics. And the key task is the differentiation between the meanings. So it's a word sense disambiguation is a task that cannot be addressed yet when the dictionaries are compiled. And a, a special difficulty is the translation of metaphors. So new linguistics, uh, specialists are also making attempts to study the problem through uh, the study of uh, brain neurons. So there are neurons that are sensitive to certain lexical um, meanings. So it's called semantic mapping. And it's uh, only uh, just a, a task for the future. Luria uh, said that the human brain perceives the object as a, a set of components. But as far as understanding grows, uh, it, it is becoming, this information is becoming more symbolic and generalized. So there are maybe in uh, mind that uh, there is a combination of sense or, and meanings. And uh, our consciousness doesn't organize words as a dictionary, as a thesaurus. And um, even the most frequent uh, meaning is not represented in a human thesaurus as the first one. Sometimes it's all rather chaotic. We uh, analyzed the group of plants and the, all the words that relate to the semantic field. And uh, we were very surprised that instead of leaf, uh, the stimulus, uh, the reaction to the stimulus was the uh, a piece of sheet, a sheet of paper, or uh, uh, other examples. And uh, some uh, important meanings uh, were just left out. So some informants just ignore the first meaning that shows that mental lexicon may have a certain dominant as an invariant sense which uh, uh, which uh, is of a quick access. So the respondents did not use uh, broad definitions to identify the meaning, just a, a small set of uh, uh, attributes uh, was quite sufficient. They often explained abstract things through abstract things, metaphor through metaphor, idiom through idiom. And uh, they uh, choose the most uh, relevant meaning for them. <laughs> Mental lexicon is a socially and culturally conditioned treasury of information. So we uh, have singled out a tendency or a propensity to make generalizations as a semantic grid 
with many inputs and outputs. Now we are building such semantic grids on networks and some uh, Russian and foreign schools uh, are involved in the same kind of research. We're trying to build a multi-layer system at the second, uh, the first uh, direct meaning, second uh, meaning, uh, are co co meanings are correlated and interacted, and the third is an output. Uh, okay, I'd like to say a few words about metaphors. You have three minutes. So, uh, um, most uh, uh, metaphors, of course, have indirect meanings. Uh, they are phraseological units, and they create big clusters according to the dominant uh, uh, attribute. We can cite a number of examples how metaphors function. For example, a two directness of metaphorical models in political discourse. Let me give a short example. The political, the use of political discourse and names the Republicans uh, as or perceive the, uh, represent the Republicans as the uh, uh, tougher politicians, while Democrats smiled, uh, softer politicians. So there is a strict uh, father and a uh, caring uh, other parent, mother. So such political metaphors are created and activated. So they, uh, such me metaphor imitates a sense of modality. So, there is a over, sort of overlapping or, uh, synergy effect of uh, perceptions. For example, uh, Trump's handshake would be uh, harder, tougher than Biden's. So, hard, tough handshake they uh, say it, they call it uh, in this way, describe in this way the Republicans. So two directional informational flows or multiplexing, uh, that's the way the metaphor function functions in two directions. A tough handshake means a tough stance taken by the Republican party in politics. Lakoff uh, talked about it. So a uh, verifying tool in understanding the functioning of metaphor is the use of the synthetic uh, approach to metaphors is a tough handshake. So it's a good model to understand the conceptual metaphors. So that's it I, I, I wanted to tell you. We study metaphors in our various lexical semantic fields. I have not uh, shown you all of them, I've just based my examples on the uh, political discourse. So are there any questions? Svetlana Andreina, thank you very much. It was really interesting. Your presentation was really interesting. The organization of metaphoric material in our mind. So my question is, if we talk about experiments, how can you assess or measure, understand and certify. So uh, how this synergetic uh, transfer happens or shift. So that a metaphor of a tough father and then a, tra a shift to a tough handshake. Um, how can we measure it? 
Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. It's really a very difficult question. Synesthetic metaphor, which uh, has this code shifts and transfers a warm character, warm handshake, or cold handshake, cold character, etc. Traits of characters. They are, of course, very subjective. One person may feel it, while the other would not. So if a handshake is tough, he, a person would think that it's a, conserv it's a, it's a conservative party member. So I agree that it's rather subjective. So my uh, task is to seek a common ground, common inver invariant. How can we verify it? Of course, through uh, 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 experiments, uh, associated experience, stimul stimulus reaction, incentive reaction. So if I answered your question, uh, another short question. You said that not all res of the respondents have a whole volume of semantic derivatives. Some are, some meanings uh, are, uh, were not uh, ident detected. So what does it mean? Is it just a gap uh, or is it just a natural thing? We do not have to keep in our a mind all semantic der derivatives as a dictionary. Yes, naturally, if we analyze the our brain and mind, there are quite uh, sustainable uh, signal uh, relations and uh, uh, neurons uh, synapses uh, um, may uh, show in future. Uh, what uh, meanings are uh, actualized so the signals are there would be we would find the connection between neurons and uh, semantic uh, mapping neuro uh, sense and meaning so if these signals are very weak it takes more time it's just categorical prototypes the core of the prototype the access to the core is immediate for example the squirrel is a bird and uh, if it's a periphery the access is not that quick it's rather slow so uh, actually this freak access is more or less uh, uh, attributable to the frequency so it's not always the case and it depends on some subjective factors on uh, society on culture of the language so we actually live in our own world and field lexical semantic field thank you very much i also have got a question so do they pre uh, preset presuppose this uh, metaphors if we uh, discuss uh, political discourse or it just uh, a historic tradition what do you think uh, okay thank you very much for your question um, uh, i think that metaphor uh, metaphor is an inborn aptitude of a human being because it's uh, a comparison of functioning of things in the world around us. Uh, so uh, lack of uh, talked about various types of metaphors, uh, conceptual, uh, spatial, so metaphors. These are models that are uh, maybe inborn as an inborn system. And uh, the, maybe the system is inborn, but models are historically bound. Uh, of course, there are some cultural specifics, but uh, when we say argument is war, it's common to all cultures. 
this attitude is common to all cultures. So the basic models are quite similar. And of course, they are, uh, on the one hand, they are universal and they are culturally bound. For example, love uh, to, of traveling. So they are just being set in our mind from the early childhood. So argument is war is something that is very clear to everybody. We cannot say argument is peace. Um, because uh, it's just not impossible, and we uh, got accustomed to argument as war. Okay, the, our next speaker is Tatiana Albertovna Klepikova, St. Petersburg State University of Economics. Her topic of presentation is Constructional Dynamics in English from Syntax to Lexis. Thank you very much. My name is Klepika Tatiana Albertovna. I represent St. Petersburg State University of Economics. So I got very interested in the idea of dynamics of metaphorical projections because it's very uh, close to my topic. I mean, the constructional dynamics in English. It closely relates to uh, metaphorical and metonymic projections. So the key problems, it's on the surface. The transfers from one category to uh, another category. Syntactic entities or structures start functioning as lexical units and show their own signs of idiomaticity. I'd like to describe a trend uh, to talk about the productiveness of the model and the conditions of uh, keeping, maintaining the meaning of a structure in the context of the language creativity. And all this will be regarded in the framework of verbocentric and anthropocentric approach. So. Uh, valency and uh, combina combination of verbs. Uh, there is semantic insufficiency of a verb, which is explained by the semantic insufficiency. And if it's uh, a verb is semantically insufficient, it uh, uh, uses uh, or fills in the gap in semantics through collocations, combinations. Uh, Did you know any verb is a syntagmatic unit? Nevertheless, lexic representation of a verb still is the most prominent factor for interpretation of a whole sentence. Some researchers state that a verb is a quantitative argument parameter, but here we face a certain paradox. What is the source of, a me of meaning, a verb or a construct and uh, there is a well-known song about war and the meaning of the phrase shown on the screen is evident but we don't have a verb in it so on the one hand a verb is a source of meaning but on the other hand it's not the only semantic source or semantic center of a certain structure. So this controversies motivated uh, the turn in the linguistic turn in this specific sphere. There are many conceptions regarding this case, but I will give you just a few of them. For example, Koplino and Boulderov and his students 
idea of in external categorization. It's a dynamic categorization, the understanding of a verb as a semantic center, pragmatic re-categorization, and a secondary interpretation or meta-presentation. Integrational field of study was first introduced by Thelma. And uh, in analysis of lexic structures, he, he has seen the future of this field of knowledge. And the grammatic constructs are usually described as syntaxes structures which can have meaning independent of um, separate words and they influence the uh, the birth of, the, of a certain meaning the creation of a certain meaning so a, a construction or a construct is a some sort of formula which consists of some empty slots some of them are some of them can change and some of them are rigid and stable and also there is a list of candidates from uh, compiled from lexis units which can or cannot be a part of a of a formula sometimes um this list may consist only of one unit. So a construct is a independent language unit. It's a pragmatic lexis uh, and a morphological synthetic unit. Because, for example, a free language unit can be describing can be found in a situation when it's used in a specific form and in specific construct so there is a sort of dichotomy of system and use with us So this juxtaposition of language in speech becomes evident and dynamic of this performance helps us to think about form and meaning. If we take a causative construction any verb in that construct will give us a certain construction and it as it turns out lays out principles of categorization we have main and peripheral categories i would like remind you of a well-known saying and i have also several examples and the if we try to look into those material the the main form is an adverb. So our construct now has very specific characteristics. There are certain language units which can be used as a secondary predicate, and they have 
negative effect um, connotations. The control semantics are broken in this situation. Wait, it happened are now constants. And we have a certain syntaxes model. Functional semantics of a subject and additional event semantics is are being neutralized. The forum becomes conventional, and as a result, we are left with an idiom which starts to lingualize in a, you know, in a certain way. Uh, I know that I don't have much time, but I have another example. Let's see. Lost somebody something construction and uh, the hyphen constructions. Let's let us keep to conclusions. Cognitive communicative motivation of unit interactions, lexic, lexis unit interaction, are, are very productive. And the uh, this productivity index is very high in this situation. These forms may be ranged as multi layered thank you for your attention thank you Tatiana Albertina are there any questions how wide is this category of formats? Uh, if we're speaking about Goldberg, everything in the language is a construct. Language doesn't consist of specific uh, lexemes, but it's a set. Any, any aspect of the language is a very interconnected system. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask a question? Hello. Your examples were very interesting because I also study semantics in Japanese and the connection of, of one uh, characteristic which you mentioned in your presentation. So my question is going to be pretty narrow. Is there any evident connection between this criteria and this characteristic of creation of this negative connotation? And um, an animate object. I think it's quite difficult to connect these two factors because any inanimate object gives us a certain result. I think that lexic semantical group has its own characteristics, uh, especially this catastrophe and disaster category. There are lots of um, units which represent these meanings. Um, they usually become a part of idioms. Mm. Which then drastically change their meaning in a different context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tatiana Albertovna. And now we will discuss another presentation. Linsa Viktorina Sergeyevna. The uh, 
Can you see my presentation? Uh, hello, everybody, dear colleagues. My presentation will be dedicated to exemplifying constructions in English with reference to the words such as and like. Exemplifying constructions we describe as constructs with prepositive um, parts and postpositive or exemplifying parts of a sentence. To begin with, let's look into look into certain examples and the explanation of them. So exemplary aspect and nominative aspect. And there are four characteristics. It's the semantic and lexis similarities, attributive connection with the sentence and specific part of a sentence and functional interconnectedness. So the last one is based on the hyper-hypnonymous relations between parts of a sentence. So a sentence has a, a prototypic structure And there is a semantic creating system. As you can see, the scale of semantic relationships has two polaric ends. And um, Authors of a Longman grammar spoken and written English link uh, several adverbs into a category which is called adverbals and appositions or linking adverbals. There is an elaboration term as well, which can be considered a uh, explanation. An, an analog of explanation term in Russian. Exemplification is a specific example of this situation. Many linguists state that in discourse, uh, discursive markers form a category of its own and Hiren is a, as well as Ken Highland, work with these spheres of knowledge, and they have their classification meta discourse markers, such as in like markers, uh, in code glosses category, which explain and clear clarify meanings of a sentence. And in their work, we can frequently find term exemplifying structures and exemplifying markers. And their main function is to introduce an example or an illustration. And we can prove that by work with dictionaries, our presentation is connected with context of two national styles derived from the corpus, the English language, from the Nature magazine and Bridget Jones diary novel by Helen Fielding. And they analyzed these materials such as construction is a more frequently used one, while the like construction and like marker in general is less frequently used. So on the slide, you can see a, ta a table which consists which, which contains this parameters and numbers. 
we can differentiate these markers into two groups, such as used as a distant marker and such as used as a contact marker. So we have only seven examples of such as used as a distant marker. This exemplifying constructs with both markers can be viewed as a multi-component construct. The first group contains these such as markers with um, generic words with articles and uh, they have a referential meaning. Um, you can see different examples in different uses of the markers. And we can see that there are lots of different contexts of use here. And in some of them, words such as etc. can be used. Sometimes such as might have a very broad meaning and be used in almost any context. Relations of this two exemplifying um, formulas are represented in a certain way in linguistics. For our presentation's first two aspects are vital. So example, these exemplifying structures are being used to per se qualify, clarify um, certain meanings in certain examples. And we have this dichotomy of specific and broad. You have two minutes left. Um, so individual parts are considered exemplifying in, in this situation because they are introduced in uh, a certain context. And it's sometimes it's very hard to differentiate the two. But in most cases, we use this enclosure strategy and inclusion uh, meaning. As you can see uh, in the example below, this inclusion relations in a construction have some um, specific characteristics. Illustrative function, stratification function, representation function. in order to show well, what are we talking about and accentuation function as well. There are some connections in Russian and English languages. In this construct, we have a script which shows us a certain individual or a certain phenomena and components of this structure are self-explanatory. And during the translation of the Bruce Jones diary novel, uh, the interpreter uses this uh, constructions in order to transfer the meaning of an author best way possible. So the transfer between different meanings and different examples is very important during translation because you 
it not only to inform but to to save this English culture is a very context-based culture. So an author must make the text readable and understandable. And such constructions help readers to understand the meaning behind uh, const several constructions. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? So, if there are no questions, I'd like to make a first clarification. The discursive marker, such as you talked about distant and contact character, what's the difference? The differences in the structure such between such and as, and there is the first element of the construction, the noun group, and they are located uh, in a distant, they are located in a distant manner. Any questions? Let's move on with our presentations. Very interesting presentations uh, focused on cognitive grammatics. Now the floor is given to Veronika Shevtsova. Uh, the topic uh, cognitive aspects of the development of the grammar category of personality in the modern English language. So let me share the screen with you, dear colleagues, dear friends. So we can see it. So, my to topic is cognitive aspects of the development of the grammar category of personality in the modern English language. Maybe it's a very broad approach, but I'm going to uh, dwell on a very, on a uh, rather specific uh, thing, but I'll talk about it later. Uh, so, cognitive linguistics uh, dwells on the representations of the basic cognitive aspects. The morphological category of personality uh, is playing an important role in cognitive discursive studies because it uh, defines or determines the uh, speech producing subject and other communicants. It's so the personality is expressed through uh, personal nouns. And in English, they are uh, a traditional grammar category. But the uh, latest developments have shown uh, that this paradigm is receding into the past. Now, the gender neutral nouns have come to the foreground. It shows the tolerance of society and gender equality. So I'll uh, focus on this gender equal pronoun they. One of the most uh, respected dictionary, Mary Webster, has defined uh, they as a, a word of the year. Uh, summing up, the guardian uh, compiling the list of the singular of the uh, words of the year also included it in the top, 10 top words. So they, as a singular, refers to neutral gender. It can use uh, instead of he or she. The neutral gender is uh, uh, very trendy in the language. One of the celebrities uh, say in the Instagram that says in the Instagram that they are uh, neutral, gender neutral. So they ask to use they singular. So.
So uh, the quotation, I'm changing my pronoun, I to them. It will, I decide to embrace myself for who I am inside and out. So uh, then uh, uh, gender binary penguin appeared in the press. Then parents had to have not to identify their children, uh, identify their gender. So gender neutral pronouns are used in the following way in English. So uh, the subject is uh, uh, indefinite pronoun, any, each, every, somebody, nobody. So the meaning is uh, generalized. Every man has their own preferences. Every parent wants their child to be successful in life. When I tell somebody a joke, they laugh. Second. Uh, when they uh, nominate professions uh, when gender is not important. For example, a blogger has posted their new blog on the internet. A doctor looks after their patients. A student must bring their homework. Traditionally, uh, uh, the language uses uh, uh, singular they. Though there are, it might lead to communicative failures. This is one of the examples from the story made by a servant, the handmaid's tale. But there is hope. God has blessed Gilead with one of the top neonatologists in the world. That's excellent. How soon can he get here? He is a she. So he is also generic and it's. Uh, uh, can be um, explained by the plot of this uh, series because uh, women could not be professional at that utopian or anti-utopian society. So I have some other examples, though I, I did not I do not cite them in my presentation. That's just an example. That means that the consumer can buy a substitute as a set of potential substitutes. If the consumer first choice is not available, then she substitutes according to substitution probability methods. It's an example of a gender polarization, as uh, shopping is done by women. It is strictly fixed social uh, role. This uh, paper was written in the late 90s. Demand estimation and assortment of tendition under substitution, at a quotation from the paper. And the third, the, with regards to a specifically gender-neutral person, Sam Smith has released their new album. Let's analyze this uh, uh, utterance uh, in terms of the cognitive linguistics. If the third person is uh, uh, related. It means that uh, there is a shift to periphery at, on the basis of the communicative situation and context. This um, uh, pronoun is used only when the communicants have the uh, common background information and knowledge. Uh, so, uh, a, a common uh, communicative and cognitive space. So, the recipient knows that Sam Smith wants him to be called they, and that's why the speaker uses this pronoun. So, there is a, a switch reference. Uh, uh, one and two. First, switch reference one and then switch reference two. As they use the possessive pronouns in a usual way, and 
so the first uh, there is the first reference is a language norm and in terms of the recipient there is also a double reference so there does not refer to switch reference one it's done indirectly through the switch from the uh, plural to singular So uh, the, there are basic concepts that are used in uh, perception of pronouns, the number and quantity, singular, pl singularity, plural, plurality. And that's why we have in our mind a very clear cut scheme. Singular, singularity means one object and a plurality, uh, many objects. And if we use them. Uh, uh, the they is singular, it's a deformation of a customary gestalt. Uh, I can uh, illustrate uh, this situation with a quotation from uh, Elena Kubrikova. The experience, the communicative experience is changing. And uh, moreover, third person can have a, a subject meaning uh, which uh, uh, nominates the, the world of objects and it can be combined with any references. In this way, it touches upon uh, uh, the uh, animate inanimate aspect. As a result, we need more efforts to actualize the object. The, communication participants uh, again uh, go beyond the customary referring references and the communication is uh, uh, hindered so because of this very uh, difficult uh, process of switching references and uh, uh, getting rid of hierarchies it's quite possible that they would become they singular would become a grammar norm uh, actually uh, uh, they singular corresponds to the uh, uh, gender uh, attitude of the english language so time will show how it will develop language uh, events only reflect the situation in the world the world view and the linguists have to follow these events and make professional assessments thank you so any questions okay you you can write them in the chat It's a very topical issue. In English, they and their are used as singular pronouns. What do you think? It's just a colloquial discourse. Or how it, will it develop? And what about the uh, research papers, should we uh, stick to the traditional use of pronouns or shall we use singular they and will it uh, come into the Russian language? Is there any date, are there any data on the Russian language? I think that we have a negative connotation in the Russian language. If we say ich, uh, they, their, in Russian, we, if we mean a one person, uh, it, it shows a negative connotation. So I'm not sure about the Russian language. As far as, the, as English is concerned, uh, in the first two cases, when they these words are quantum words, uh, quantity words, and to uh, nominate profession, it has become a grammar norm, and they are used in speech in paper. As far then the neutral uh, related to a human being it's uh, only colloquial but it may it may become a norm sooner because uh, usually uh, 
uh, it's, it starts in the colloquial language and then these changes uh, will become norm and norm. Thank you very much. Any questions? So our next topic is our presentation by Ulyana Strijak. Her presentation is Japanese Sentences Extensional Structure Cognitive Modeling Approach. Yes, we can see your presentation. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I represent the High School of Economics, National Research University, Russia. Today, I'd like to share my experience in the studies of the Japanese sentence of sequential structure. Uh, and to show you semantic uh, features that uh, uh, denote the uh, actential status, uh, what is called in linguistics agency. These issues are very interesting in terms of the language, uh, Japanese language. Japanese language has a very strict hierarchy, which is typical of the Japanese culture of Japanese minds and at society. All these things are closely connected. So how these issues of hierarchy are reflected in the language? We decided to study this issue. So we are interested in the behavior of inanimate uh, objects because in Japanese and in the Japanese culture and society, uh, they uh, do not use inanimate objects or abstract notions as agents because it sounds, it doesn't sound natural. So the agent, the subject of the sentence uh, cannot be inanimate. If it happens, uh, then uh, something should be done about it. Another interesting thing, the Japanese language is changing and such phenomena uh, are becoming more frequent as uh, inanimate objects become agents in Japanese under the influence of translation. That's the influence of the European cultures, especially English. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we need to carry on additional studies to make some conclusions. So the material of parallel corpora of Japanese uh, translations of the Russian literary text. Astanomova said that the analysis of the mechanism of translation make it possible to uh, uh, identify to identify and to measure the language phenomena. So the translation helps a lot. And we uh, are involved in the analysis of translations. So the, uh, I took uh, examples from uh, several uh, literary works for example, Idiot by Dostoevsky. These are translations of uh, uh, different uh, periods. We also included some uh, diachronic aspects, though I won't have time today. We won't talk about the differences, we'll stay, we'll talk about commonalities. So if there is an inanimate object, 
uh, on the place uh, at the place of um, subject. So, what does the different language do? First, the focus of attention is shifted. So, this is the example uh, attacks of his disease made immediate, made him an idiot. And uh, the translation is he became nearly an idiot because of the attacks. The second example, uh, the <coughs> main protagonist, uh, uh, Prince uh, Mishkin, uh, says, your portrait has struck me. So the portrait found me an agent in the utterance. So the translation was the prince saw a portrait and was really stricken by it. So uh, attacks, we, uh, it's a sort of a secondary information. But here, the portrait is very important for the plot because his, uh, uh, Prince Mishkin saw the portrait and fell in love with Nastasia Filipovna because it was a portrait of Nastasia Filipovna, the second protagonist of the uh, novel. So the portrait is a very important uh, phenomenon. Uh, so maybe it should be used as a agent, the main actant. And I said that Japanese sometimes uh, agrees with such construction structures. So the question is uh, boils down to the choice. It's just a process of choice to keep or to transform the structure. And there are some examples when uh, the structure is kept, um, but more than 50% of such cases show that Japanese transforms this grammar structure. And so all our inanimate objects are removed from the position of the subject, of the agent, of the utterance. And so the focus of attention is shifted. And the question arises uh, uh, that uh, uh, whether Dostoevsky's uh, attitude and views have been kept. Of course, uh, uh, these are strategies of uh, translation, domestication, uh, foreignization, and uh, we have a discussion of them going on. So we just uh, made an analysis of uh, such structures. In our corpora, we have about 1,500 uh, examples. The so we singled out trends. It's a shift of the focus. And so the change uh, with keeping the dieters, but uh, reducing the agency of the predicates. For example, the uh, sorrow is coming or just Uh, is uh, or is just uh, scrunching or is just coming the second uh, example is the change of dietes so uh, that's for, uh, an example from Bulgaka Mar Mar Margarita is uh, taken by bliss or is immersing into bliss. So you can see that there is a shift of accent. It is very difficult to find the 
a compromise between the grammar equivalent and uh, creative value. And the usage of passive structures is, or constructions. This is the corporal parallel text uh, with its uh, linguistic marking. You can see that we have taken many uh, works, Dostoevsky, Ulitska, Pilevin, Strugatska, Chekhov, Tolstoy, classical literature and modern writers. So what was our ranging? The subject where the prototypicity of the agent is growing to a person. A man, and also we we, we ranked the predicate. We used two parameters, two uh, <coughs> variables, and so then we uh, uh, produced a visualization in the form of a, a orange cloud. So we can uh, analyze this orange cloud, cloud, but the conclusion is that this orange cloud is a human being. And so uh, it's the uh, frequency of usage. So more than 50% of examples, the shift is made towards a person. The agency is decreasing. It is shifted to the left when the static predicates uh, and, and the verbs are used reflexive constructions so these are translated transformations used so these are our conclusions and we are going to continue our research Yana Petrovna, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. I've got some questions. This characteristic of the Japanese language. So in, in my examples, the construction to lose somebody something is a verb lose being remodeled as a I it costed me something. Lose has no subject in this variant, so I, I lost something. And we can see this agency. And then model across him election. This him uh, means that he did that. It's that's a subject, and uh, there are many uh, subjects like in, in uh, Russian. But is there a similar construction in Japanese? In Japanese, there. It's widespread. There are widespread constructions, not ergative, ergative, but uh, almost ergative constructions when a sentence is being remodeled with the use of the in half ergative forms. The the agent, a subject is still very important. The theme of a sentence, human still remains a theme of, of a sentence. So it's quite difficult to explain it in Russian, but even if you use um, forms like you mentioned, a human being uh, is still grammatically uh, a priority. 
А дальше уходит ругативный падеж, уходит. Да, совершенно верно, именно так. Поняла, примерно. Да. Agency is, is still the most important element. Um, so Japanese is less inclined to use metaphors um, because inanimate object is less frequently used as an uh, object. Um, yes, that uh, metaphors are clearly seen as a fiction um, tool, but in, in Russian uh, metaphors are dissolved in language, but in Japan, to, to a Japanese person, um, metaphors are very evident. So the meaning, the meaning of it is not dissolved. Thank you. Are there any more? Are there any questions? Um, I have a comment. And there is a certain there are certain differences in Japanese culture. Feels like a very separate culture. So, so us component is still very evident and subject is deeply concealed syntax wise a predicate is a tool to unearth this agency and uh, Japanese is, is a very complicated system it's implicitly shown in the language. What did you use to to analyze corpus? I did it myself, but I using Python remodeled it into a digestible form, but I self handedly created it. I started with Excel table. So now the sketch engine no, no, that was single-handedly created. I didn't use any resource. I marked up the whole thing by myself. So the selection was was made by hand, not by not with a, a program. No, no, I I did it myself. I tried many options, but uh, the result is very is very strange. For example, a general took a head and went inside. So you, you have some aberrations and um, wrong results, and uh, that's actually a headache now. We're trying to find a solution to that. Thank you, Ryana Petrovna. Now, this is Papaya Katarzyna Lydia's presentation on borders and social media. Some remarks on the influence of social media on young people. Are you with us? Is the speaker present? I can't see her right now. The speaker is absent. Well, then we get to the next speaker. Lumila Yaroslavna Silina is a gender fair language in modern German media is an object of language criticism. Lumila Yaroslavna, the floor is yours. Dear, dear colleagues, can you see the presentation? Mm -hmm. Everything is fine, thank you. Dear colleagues, thank you 
for having me. I represent the St. Petersburg State University and the theology faculty. I have also a presentation on gender fair language. And lately, gender fair language is a topical theme in German media. Sprachkritik uh, is a uh, language criticism. In my presentation, I analyzed recent German media materials and used discursive analysis uh, in Rank and Spitzmüller, professors which created this multi-layered analysis. It's the external text situation, intertextual characteristics, and um, positioning of language actors. These three aspects are going to be developed further in my presentation. So the, we have this issue in the German language connected with, with names and professions, nationalities, all that in German are um, formative and they they also are based on this gender separation and there are several strategies to create this different gender uh, forms of a uh, word uh, there is this generalizing uh, form which uses masculine form and it's used as a general form for any for any word for any phenomena uh, the feminist feminism ling ling linguistic studies uh, and critics of different forms of presentation. Gender linguistics is a modern stage, modern step of gender gender learning. There are also two catalysts of modern discussion, the changes in civil law and now citizens can identify themselves with different gender, different genders. For example, they can represent themselves as non-binary. And the second catalyst occurred during January 2021, when uh, the new edition of the Luden Dictionary was published. Uh, so the new edition now have two separate articles for masculine and feminine words, which was not the case previously, because the only the masculine form was used to describe the word. What forms of gender 
uh, neutrality do we have? So there are gender specific forms and gender gender neutral forms. So now we have three different specific gender forms, masculine, feminine, and uh, gender neutral or non-binary form. So first two forms were native uh, to the German language, explicitly called masculine and feminine aspects. And they were widely used in written language, as well as in verbal language. So there were different graphic forms of gender neutral representation, hyphens, slash, or the so-called gender star. Also, there are some generalization strategy when you use gender neutral form to represent a group of people with different genders. And some synthetic new for newer forms, uh, for example, the uh, Uh, those vi visual visual forms like words and studiert. On the third group, which adds in the general generalifying uh, form, which can be used for any gender. And Alan Polchheit coined this form. And also this E and the forms, which eliminate any gender differences, which eliminate any gender form. They just generalize. Uh, this third uh, form. Not a widespread one, and uh, uh, usually scientists don't take it seriously. Here you can see sides of this gender conflict, or gender issue. So there are two sides. Four gender specific forms stand uh, some universities and media, like Der Spiegel, for example, and um, against gender specific forms. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you have two minutes left. Uh, so, yes, Media Der Spiegel is a left liberal um, media outlet. And then there are some polar opinions here. So, those who are against gender specific forms are usually associated with conservative views. So, they Languages, nature, sometimes it's pragmatic, and uh, I have a very specific, specific table where you can see those differences, both sides for and against gender specific forms in the language. So you can see that. Uh, there are certain categories in the language, and these two groups have quite polar opinions. 
for example, um, this opinion that a language represent, represents reality but doesn't change it, So these two sides have a very heated discussion in terms of this ling linguistic differences. Then we analyze keywords um, that shows that there is a distinct difference in, uh, in mindsets in self-representation and representations of so-called others. So many scientists and researchers expressed their critical remarks regarding modern political and social situation in Germany. So now uh, there is an image of an old white person who clings on his power and it's considered conservative. It's considered a public enemy while a young, modern, and liberal person is considered to be an image of a socially accepted image of good, or everything good which can be found in, in the society. Almost every aspect of language is now being criticized with that gender optic. And uh, there are some uh, metaphors and uh, jokes regarding the modern situation in, in linguistics. So the dialogue is really heated. And uh, now these two groups are polarized. And new, new ideas are accepted with certain, certain difficulties. There are lots of conservatively of conserv conservative people out there. Thank you for your attention. I would be pleased to answer your question. Thank you very much, Lemelia Salomon. Are there any questions to this? presentation. I have a short question to you. What, what do you think about the situation? Do you have any forecasts? I think that some of these gender specific and gender neutral forms will remain, but some of them are going to be rejected. But this, this thought of, in, of, a, of a language being uh, maimed or changed in a bad way uh, will remain, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Then we will... Uh, this is the last presentation for today. So Vladislav Yurevich Viryuchin, communicative interaction of addressant and recipient in the German business correspondence. Hello, dear colleagues. Can you hear me? Everything is fine? Okay. I would like to present on the communicative, communicative interaction of addressant and recipient in the German business correspondence to come up with a term for interactions in, in the business sphere to find a, a specific, specific criteria that influence this correspondence. I would like to delve deeper into business interactions and specifics of it. 
To do that, I will have some examples shown and uh, I will translate them into Russian. Specificity of business correspondence is that both sides of correspondence try to find mutual connection and they try to to find consensus which is going to be profitable for both sides. Thus, to communicate in the correct way, both sides should be very polite during the communication and use specific communicative tools in order to reach the most profitable outcome. To begin communication, you have you have to send an, a commercial offer, usually with a short introductory message, for example. Dear Mr. Borisov, let me send you this commercial offer to work on documentation in order to broaden our work and elaborate on decisions that were made on during our previous meeting. So this message underlies priorities of another side. This also excludes any arrogance from communication. The discussion will, will be completed and the one of the side will receive the affirmative reaction. Other side will react in a certain way as well. For example, after we received your commercial offer, we try to analyze it, and I can assure you that we are ready to further work with you as a potential partner. So this reaction is being portrayed using this verb C in order to represent maximum um, there are some issues with the internet connection. Uh, so so this so this tool is usually used to Affirm, to affirmate reaction and not to harm the public image. So the outcome of a business correspondence depends on politeness and positive attitude during communication. There are some communicative tactics being used by the addressee in order to win attention and win um, other partners and they try to affect uh, the other side of this business talks. Dear ladies and gentlemen, So we've seen some defects in your work, which are represented in the in addition one, we kindly ask you to get rid of these defects and uh, 
and then trying to further elaborate that in our future talks. So during this communication address, he and the customer tried to come up with a solution and find, find a way to get things right as short as possible. And they tried to do that without resorting to rudeness. In this context, we have certain language forms that represent this kind and polite but very strict form of inquiry. If an addressee or a customer try to influence uh, their partner, and they try to urge him to, to So if they fail to communicate, uh, their talks might then turn into open confrontation. I, I won't read this uh, example to say to save us some time. So ladies and gentlemen, because you provided us with fake information, we have severe losses. We ask you to set things right. And if you won't do that as short as possible, we will sue you. So we can see that in this situation, you can't really communicate anymore with your client. And the only thing left is to go to court. And in German, we have this strict forms which represent unsatisfaction. So our presentation shows that there are certain linguistic and extra linguistic forms that influence the realization of the communicative situation. And the specifics of business correspondence show us that it has a tendency to be more polite and neutral in order to reach compromise and uh, maximize profits. Also, there are several additional factors influence the communication and if any party will ignore those factors, those talks escalate really quickly and they become very rude and mean. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? We have no questions. Oh, I have a I have a short one. Thank you. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation. So this language practices of an addressee. So you had several examples of an addressee offering something to, to a client. But do you have any examples Uh, examples for communication from the other side when uh, the client is ready to connect to to accept the offer but there has to be a certain neutral position 
when a client still not decided whether to accept or decline this offer. Of course, we have some examples in this communicative chain and uh, transformation of reaction of a client on uh, certain offers. And we analyze all forms of communication, but it all boils down to the compromise and understanding. And if if both sides understand each other, um, they reach an agreement. If they don't, uh, they begin to communicate in a more harsh way, usually. So it's all about, uh, about the balance. I wouldn't really agree with, with you, but maybe there are some situations when you can have a neutral stance and maybe there are certain forms inside uh, in a language which represent these neutral stances. Well, as I've already stated before, a client has a superior linguistic um, position. So a client uh, can behave himself in a more frivolous manner. In a way, so a client usually spends less time and less uh, linguistic tools to communicate. So an address C um, is in a more tense position. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Are there any more questions to the speaker? Thank you, Vladislav Yurevich. So this is it for today. Maybe somebody wants to express their opinion on today's session. Maybe Vladimir Nikolaevich is going to, to say something as a host of this session. Well, if you, if you, well, if you mean Dmitry Nikolaevich, that I certainly may say something about the session. First of all, we may discuss something, if you want. Uh, so how did you like today's presentations? Did you like them? Was everything fine today? I think we had a lot of interesting presentations, not only centered on English and Russian, but we had several uh, presentations on German language and Japanese language, discourse and cultural presentations. We had some interdisciplinary presentations as well, so it's a very broad, thematically wise specter of presentations, which was quite interesting in the to hear. And we had a lot of um, very deep questions. I think that we had a very dense, fruitful scientific dialogue and we will be able to further elaborate on themes that were present today 
we maybe we can base some of our further works on this presentations. I thank you for this two days of work. Express my gratitude to Juan Andreina. I'd like to thank our translators and interpreters. Uh, for their work, for their, for their interpretation. I'd like to draw a conclusion and wish you a good coffee break before we start our plenary session. And I will hope to see you all there. I would like to say, you know, Igor Ivanov, her and Tatiana Nikolaevna for their technical support on this event. Thank you very much for structuring our session. So the organizational committee proved to be very professional. We had no issues with organization. Even though the session was very dense. And I hope that probably next year we all will meet in person despite all benefits of distant performance. Probably it would be a good thing to uh, host a more traditional session. The conference. Yeah. This was a good stimulus for further discussion and academic work. Thank you all. And I hope to meet you all during the plenary session. Thank you, dear colleagues, and goodbye.